Imagine a figure 8. Now, let's place it on a XZ Cartesian plane in order to systematize its description and build a formula that faithfully describes it. You see shortly why we chose XZ rather than the more traditional XY Cartesian plane. Imagine a point traveling along this figure 8. It would not cross the intersection this way, but rather this way. The next step is to create a solid of revolution by introducing a third axis, denoted as Y, and rotating the figure 8 with respect to the Z axis. This is a very simple surface, so a 2D space embedded in three dimensions, but it has some very interesting properties. First of all, it is a closed surface, in the sense that it has no boundaries. It has a self-intersection, which is a unique point, and it is a direct consequence of the way in which the surface was created, out of a figure 8. This surface probably has a Mobius strip in it, but I'm honestly not completely sure about that. It is, however, non-orientable. There is no doubt about it. The self-intersection is present just because it is embedded in three dimensions. If it were embedded in four dimensions, it would not have the self-intersection. Let's explore the fascinating way in which the surface is non-orientable. Imagine a two-dimensional lizard living in the surface. This lizard is right-handed. It moves around with no problems along the curvature of the space. But when it decides to cross the central point, a few very weird things happen. First of all, at least for us observing the scene in three dimensions, we would see the lizard shrinking as it approaches the central point until it becomes just a point, and then he comes out the other side with opposite orientation. This other side is what we, observing the scene in three dimensions, would call the surface's inside. Of course, there's no inside or outside from the perspective of the lizard because it's two-dimensional. For it, the surface is not necessarily embedded in a higher dimensional space. At this point, his entire body was flipped on itself and the lizard became left-handed. He could continue to move around with no problems at all, just as in the beginning, along the space's curvature, but this time with his orientation reversed. It's really hard to find a Mobius strip in this space, even though it might contain one. The problem is that, after cutting it, and sliding its walls, it's very hard not to pinch a point. It's just a very weird embedding. More insights could be drawn from embedding it in four dimensions, rather than three, for example. But the issue here is that we can't imagine four dimensions in a tangible way. Just as the figure 8 is a weird embedding of a circle S1 from 3D into 2D, Maybe this space is a sphere S2 embedded, in a particular way, from 4D into 3D. It's just a guess. By the way, let's give it a name so that we can easily refer to it. Padushka surface. The word padushka means pillow in Russian, and it does look like a pillow. Let me know in the comments if you guys would like to know the story of how and why I came up with this name. This is the quartic formula that describes the Padushka surface, where A here can be any real number other than zero. I plotted it in Desmos, and it was exactly what I expected. To understand how to come up with this formula, you just have to check, which is not a very hard exercise to do, that the equation for the figure 8 shape is this. It is called the lemniscate of Bernoulli. The equation for the Padushka surface is just a simple generalization of it in three dimensions, since it's a solid of revolution created out of a figure 8 in the XZ plane. The Padushka surface is, thankfully, described by a quartic equation, not a quintic or higher. Otherwise, it would potentially lack exact algebraic solutions, which is a consequence of the Abel-Ruffini theorem. This theorem states that there are no general algebraic solutions, in other words, using radicals, to polynomial equations of degree 5 or higher. If you look at its plot in the xyz space again, you can notice that the unique self-intersecting point, 
at the origin, is responsible for flipping the orientation of any normal vector passing through it. This shows that it is not possible to define a consistent vector space normal to Padushka at each point. However, if we change this quartic formula slightly, changing the sign in front of z squared in the right-hand side from negative to positive, we get a sphere. So this changing sign from positive to negative is exactly what creates the non-orientability of the surface. Another thing that I tried to do before figuring out the correct quartic equation was to change the signs in front of z squared in the left-hand side. I'm sharing this just out of curiosity and to help you guys understand why and how this specific formula is the one that effectively describes the Padushka surface. As you can see, this surface is the union of a cone and a hyperboloid, which are two classic quartic forms, so definitely not the Padushka surface. Let's compare the Padushka surface now to other fundamental topological surfaces. Imagine we have a rectangle with specific directions given to each of its edges. If we embed it in three dimensions and glue together its opposite edges, following the arrows, we can build a torus. Now, let's start with a rectangle with these orientations for its edges. The first two edges, the ones that point in the same direction, are glued together just as before. No surprises here. But then the other two have opposite orientations with respect to each other. The most traditional way of gluing them would be by rotating the circular top and poking it through, forming a self-intersection, which is a circle, and then gluing the two circles with matching directions. This is just the famous Klein bottle. It has infinite points of self-intersection when embedded in 3D, but no self-intersections at all when embedded in 4D. Let's perform this last step in a slightly different way. We start with the same rectangle of the Klein bottle. Glue the first two edges, and then bend the top and the bottom circular edges inside. Finally, glue opposite points in each circle to match the orientations of the edges. After doing it for all the infinite points on each circle, you will still get a closed surface with self-intersection, just like we got with a Klein bottle. The advantage here is that its embedding in 3D has only one unique self-intersection, in contrast to the infinite self-intersecting points along the circle in the Klein bottle. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. This raises a question. Is the Padushka space just a variation of the Klein bottle with a different embedding in three dimensions, such that it minimizes the number of self-intersecting points? Or is it an entirely new topological surface of its own? In order to understand whether the Padushka space is a variation of the Klein bottle, we need to study its main topological invariants. For example, the Klein bottle has genus 2, so two non-orientable holes. But a priori, the Padushka surface seems to have less than two holes. To be more precise, in orientable surfaces, the genus is the number of holes. Meanwhile, in non-orientable surfaces, the genus is the sum of the number of cross caps in it. We'll see shortly exactly what a cross cap is. The genus is a topological invariant that is preserved under any kind of embedding. So if the Padushka surface is merely a variation of the Klein bottle with a different embedding, these two surfaces must have the same genus. But how can we calculate the genus of the Padushka surface? Right after that, another question came to mind. Maybe the Padushka surface is a variation of the cross cap? They look really similar when embedded in three dimensions. But what is a cross cap after all? And how does it relate to the Padushka surface? Imagine a rectangle with opposite sides having opposite orientations. Glue the first pair of edges together, and you get a Mobius strip. Now comes the hard part. You need to glue the boundaries adding a twist. In other words, reversing once again their directions. It is really challenging to imagine this process, because a line of self-intersecting points is inevitably formed. This is the real projective plane. And its representation here 
So the way we decided to embed it in three dimensions is called the cross cap. These are other possible embeddings of the real projective plane. They are all topologically equivalent. Notice, though, how it is necessary for all of them to have self-intersections. The cross-cap embedding of the real projective plane looks really similar to the Padushka surface. But I don't think they are topologically the same. In order to decide whether they are topologically equivalent or not, we need to add rigor to the discussion. And this can be best achieved in this context by talking about some specific topological invariants. The Euler characteristic is one of the most fundamental topological invariants, and it is a number that is preserved under any kind of embedding or homeomorphic transformation. Basically, if two spaces are topologically equivalent to each other, they must have, among other properties, the same Euler characteristic, denoted with the Greek letter chi. The Euler characteristics of many fundamental surfaces are listed in the PDF link in the description that we did not have time to cover in the video. Check it out. Here, we'll just show you how I calculated the Euler characteristic of the Padushka surface. Pick a random point in the Padushka surface to be a vertex. Draw two edges that are loops that cannot be continuously deformed into one another and that cannot be shrunk to a point. These are fundamental loops. If you cut through these edges, you get the polygon representation of the Padushka surface, which is the same as the one for the Klein bottle. Now it is easy to count the number of vertices, edges, and faces. There is one vertex, two edges, and one face. As a consequence, its Euler characteristic is zero, which is the same as the Euler characteristic of the Klein bottle, and it is different from the Euler characteristic of the cross cap, or real projective plane, which is 1 instead. Am I missing something here? Let us know in the comments section below. Now let's talk about another very important topological invariant, the genus. The genus of an orientable surface is calculated as 2 minus the Euler characteristic divided by 2, so the number of holes. The genus of a non-orientable surface is calculated as 2 minus the Euler characteristic, so the number of non-orientable holes, or cross caps. With this in mind, the Klein bottle, which is non-orientable, has genus 2. The cross cap, which is topologically equivalent to the real projective plane and is non-orientable, has genus 1. The Padushka surface, which is non-orientable as well, and considering that I calculated its Euler characteristic correctly, has genus 2. Therefore, I would guess that the Padushka surface is a variation of the Klein bottle. So, a connected sum of two cross caps that minimizes the number of self intersections. It possesses just one self intersecting point, which is pretty convenient. The Padushka surface can still be considered a distinct geometric model, but topologically, I would guess that it is the same as the Klein bottle. It presents, though, its own kind of embedding. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. To be very honest, the Padushka surface cannot be a new topological surface because of something called the classification theorem of closed surfaces. You'll find more details in the PDF link. But basically, it states that any connected closed surface belongs to one of the following three families. The sphere, the connected sum of g tori with g greater or equal to 1, and the connected sum of k real projective planes, with k greater or equal to 1. The Padushka surface definitely belongs to the third family. If you'd like to know more about the classification of topological surfaces, check out this video. And if you really enjoy studying algebraic topology and geometric topology, you might want to check out these excellent books. And also, don't forget that we have a website where, in one of its sections, you can submit your own personal research. Just send it to us via mail, and more details in the description. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.